Steve Bluer was undoubtedly one of the most high profile stars in the fledging era of football in England, with his goal scoring abilities and marketable appearance setting a precedent which would be followed on by many players in the years to come. A striker who predominantly played for Derby County but also had a stint at Middlesbrough and made 23 caps for the England national team at a time when that was actually quite a lot given the dearth of international games that were taking place at the time, Bloomer's record is almost unparalleled in the English game ever since. Derby fans will probably not need to hear his story being retold, since he is arguably the club's greatest ever player, and he is extremely familiar to the Pride Park faithful, but to everyone else, much like many other players from those bygone eras, he has slipped under the radar a little bit, and in this video I'm going to talk about his story from a prolific marksman to a World War I prisoner of war in Germany, and everything else in between. My immense thanks go out to Paul Kenley, and I apologise profusely if I'm butchering your name completely, for requesting that I profile Bloomer, and you can forever hold the distinction of being the first person to ever request a video on this channel, although given that this is the current percentage of the world's population that currently subscribe to my channel, I don't think it really counts for much in the grand scheme of things. But nonetheless, thank you very much for the suggestion, and yeah, I hope I do it justice. If you want to increase that particular percentage of subscribers, and it would genuinely mean the world to me if you did, then hit that red button below the video, and of course, comment with other things you would like to see me cover in the future, and I'll endeavour to make them happen. But for now, let's get into a video about arguably Britain's first ever superstar striker. Steve Bloomer was born in 1874, and he had his eyes set on following in his father's footsteps and being a blacksmith, becoming an apprentice at the age of 12 in a role which was ironically called a Smith Striker, a prescient sign for his actual future profession. However, in spite of him wanting to go into the blacksmith business originally, he was a natural sportsman, as not only was he skilled in football, but also in cricket, cribbage, sprinting and baseball. He would go on to start for the Derby Nomads Cricket Club throughout the 1890s, and he was actually very close to going fully down the baseball route instead of football, although he would end up playing it professionally as well, winning the English Baseball Cup three times with the Derby County Baseball Club. He decided in the end to focus primarily on football, and he joined St Chad's Choir in 1887 at the age of 13, catching the eye in an under-15 Derbyshire Shield final, although it is worth noting that his team did lose 14-0, so what he did to justify his talent, I'm not quite sure. In 1891, he moved on to Derby Midland, although when the club merged with Derby County in the same year, Bloomer made the transition with them, immediately taking up rank in Derby's third team as an amateur before going professional in April 1892. His debut came at the start of the next season against Stoke, with his first goal arriving three weeks after he made his first appearance when he scored a penalty against West Brom, the first of 11 goals he would score for the club that season. The next season, he bettered that record by netting 19 goals, and since nets were introduced in 1892, I can actually use the word netting in this particular context accurately, whereas beforehand, shots that went in between the goal frames probably ended up hitting some innocent bystanders in the crowd. His fine form saw him caught up to the England setter for the first time in 1894, and he was scoring each of his first 10 appearances for the national team, hitting 19 goals during those 10 games. Although he slowed down somewhat for his final 13 games for the three lines, only netting a miserly 9 goals, it brought his overall tally up to 28 goals from just 23 caps, which was a high number for that time, and he is only one of two players, alongside Vivian Woodward, to average better than a goal a game for England amongst those who have scored 20 or more goals. Curiously enough, Woodward also won 23 caps, but scored one more goal than Bloomer did, although Bloomer stated on many occasions that he had two goals unfairly taken away from him, as they were either credited to others or rendered invalid. As a player, Bloomer was the out-and-out -out centre forward of the team, with his sprinting capabilities putting him in good stead to outrun the defenders, especially given that he could run 100 yards in just 11.5 seconds. His England captain Ernest Needham described him as quote, a twisting tormentor with a wonderful shot, close quotes, and he could score all types of goals from tappings to 25 yard thunderbolts, even firing home from the centre circle for England against Scotland in 1907. He would also be the team's provider on many occasions, but as a result of assist counts only really starting to be consistently tallied up during the 21st century, we'll never know just how many he did set up, but rest assured, it was probably quite a few, especially since of course, he was the focal point of the teams he played for. Described by one journalist as being as slippery as an eel, that quote should give you some indication that he was able to twin his speed with agility and the ability to jink in between defences, and when he was on his day, the only way to stop him was by hacking him down. He was well aware of his talents, and even had the audacity to celebrate his goals by doing a cartwheel in the days where goal celebrations were almost non-existent, and certainly none that were as exuberant as that. 
However, he had a notoriously poor temperament, often looking in disgust whenever an attack broke down at the player who gave the ball away, and if the look wasn't reciprocated, he would kick up a fuss and storm back into his position in order to showcase his anger at a failed attack. I remember reading in a child's football book many years ago that he also despised receiving aerial passes, preferring instead for the ball to be passed to his feet, even going so far as to ignore balls that were lobbed over to him, although I couldn't find any evidence to justify this particular claim, but if true, it certainly would have showcased his petulance. What set Bloomer apart from all his contemporaries though, besides of course his ability and lack of temperament, was that he was one of football's first ever advertisers. He would receive a multitude of opportunities for commercial endorsements throughout the course of his career as he would bring publicity to companies who sold things such as clothing, books, magazines and tobacco, even going so far as to feature on 19 separate cigarette cards. His most successful venture was into footwear as he endorsed his own pair of football boots which he called Lucky Striker and he would often wear them during games which stood out from the crowd given that they were white as opposed to the traditional black. He also created what went on to be called Perfa Gripper, the world's first football boot with moulded studs, which set the precedent and continued to be used well into the 1980s. The main reason why he advertised all those products though, was of course because he was a world class player, and a remarkably consistent one at that. Between 1892, the year in which he made his debut, and 1913, the year before he retired, Bloomer's lowest goal tally in all competitions was 10, and his highest, achieved in 1897, was 31, and he won the award as the league top scorer on five separate occasions. Surprisingly though, he didn't win a single major trophy, as he reached three FA Cup finals with the Rams, but lost on all three occasions, and his best league finish with them was a runners-up spot in 1896. In March 1906, he made a shock move to an extremely ambitious Middlesbrough side for £750, which was a lot of money at the time. Borough were assembling a star-studded squad, with Bloomer joining the likes of Alf Common, who had become Britain's first ever £1,000 player the year prior, and Fred Pentland, and although the fee seemed extortionate for a 34-year-old who was supposedly nearing the end of his career, Bloomer more than justified his price tag. He finished the club's top goal scorer in both of his first two seasons with them, helping them steer well clear of relegation troubles, but his former club, Derby, deprived of their star man, were relegated the season after Bloomer's departure. However, the lure of his hometown club was too great, and in 1910 he returned for one last hurrah, helping the club back to the promised land of the first division in 1912 after scoring 18 goals in 36 games as a 38-year-old. Bloomer finally decided to call it quits in January 1914, just 11 days after his 40th birthday, although his last ever game would actually be in 1923 in an All International vs Derby County game, in which, perhaps predictably, he scored a penalty. He scored his 331st and final goal for the Rams in September 1913, and his final tally puts him 130 goals ahead of second place Kevin Hector in Derby's all-time top goal scorers. And to be honest with you, I don't see that record being beaten for a very long time. By July 1914, he had moved over to Germany to take charge of Britannia Berlin, leaving behind his wife and children, but within a month, war had been declared and Blumer was caught in the crossfire as an enemy living on German turf. Although the plan originally was to simply keep an eye out on all foreigners who were living in Germany, no less the people who were from nations against whom Germany were fighting, that remit went out the window within three months of the war's outbreak, and Blumer was arrested in 1914 and sent to the Ruhleben internment camp, which had as many as 5,500 prisoners at one point. Like most people, Bloomer believed that the war would soon be over, so he was somewhat nonplussed about his arrest. But of course, the war wasn't done by Christmas, and he ended up staying in the Ruhleben camp for three and a half years. The conditions for the prisoners at first were awful, sleeping on straw where lights would roam frequently, wearing clothes that were donated to them by the local people, including clogs and coats, and only being allowed to eat a small amount of watery porridge and blood sausage every day. Over time, as the realisation hit that they may well be in it for the long haul, a society started to form amongst the prisoners, who included the likes of former Spurs manager John Cameron, ex Sheffield Wednesday outside forward Fred Spixley, and Bloomer's ex Borough teammate Frank Penland, who went on to coach at Athletic Bilbao and Athletic Madrid, now of course Atletico Madrid, post war, as well as a myriad of other sports people and intellectuals, and they started to turn to sports, as well as receiving a multitude of other lessons in various subjects to keep themselves entertained. 
The sport was originally banned by the camp's organisers, but eventually the prisoners started to gain more of an influence in the day-to-day -day running of the camp, and they began to organise league and cup competitions for football into which each of the 14 barracks entered two separate teams. Bloomer captained Rouleben's overall team in their first ever match in March 1915 and took part in an England vs the rest of the world 11 two months later as well, despite being 41 at this point, but he admitted that the growing presence of sport within the camp saved him from depression, and perhaps something even worse than that as well. He went on to lead a team called Bloomer's Barracks, winning the league title in the first Hall Laban Football League season, and when the camp turned to cricket in the summer, he proved that he was still as versatile a sportsman as ever, as he hit a camp record 204 in one innings. He originally thought that he would be able to leave quite soon as a result of his age, but when he was summoned to the commandment's office for the first time in April 1917, it wasn't to let him know that he could go, but that his 17-year-old daughter, Violet, had died. In March 1918 though, he was finally let go, with a football match being played in his honour just before his departure, although it was on the sole condition that he stayed in the Netherlands until the armistice was signed, meaning that he finally returned to Derby in November 1918, 11 days after the armistice was signed, thus spending the entirety of the war overseas. He briefly coached at Blauwitz Amsterdam while stationed in the Netherlands, but he really made a name for himself with Real Union in Spain, as in 1924, the year after he joined them, he guided them to a Copa del Rey title, the third in their history, beating Catalan giants FC Barcelona 5-1 after a replay in the semi-finals and Real Madrid 1-0 in the final. Immediately after this triumph, Bloomer left his post and returned to Derby as assistant manager in 1925. In 1936, his wife died but left him nothing in her will, although she left around £979, which is roughly £62,000 in today's money, to a turner by the name of Frederick Wells, although why she did this, as far as I or anyone else could tell, is unknown. By this point, Bloomer was penniless despite all of his previous commercial endorsements and suffering from ill health himself, and Derby's directors sent him on a recuperative cruise around Australia and New Zealand in 1937 with the hope that his health would improve. Sadly, it didn't work, and in April 1938, at the age of 64, Bloomer passed away. His legacy in the English game as a striker is still immense, as even though he retired from playing some 107 years ago, only one person has ever overtaken his total of 314 First Division goals in English football history, namely Jimmy Greaves with 357, and only three players have done so across Europe's top five leagues, namely Cristiano Ronaldo, Gerd Muller, and Lionel Messi. To put that into context, the most likely person in England to overtake Bloomer who is currently playing right now, Harry Kane, is still 154 goals behind him, which means that, if he plays for 8 more seasons in the top flight, he'll need to average out 19 goals a season just to equal him, although it's likely that Kane will have played in much fewer games than Bloomer's 536 First Division appearances. When goals per game ratios for England are considered, if Kane were to reach 100 appearances for the three lines, he would need to score 122 goals in total in order to match Bloomer's 1.22 goals per game ratio, and as he is currently on 32 goals from 51 caps, he requires 90 from 49 in order to achieve such heights. Although give him a load of games against San Marino and I'm sure he'll do it. Furthermore, Bloomer was arguably football's first ever marketing man, which might not seem abnormal nowadays given the marketing appeal of players like Neymar, Cristiano Ronaldo and Kylian Mbappe, amongst of course a plethora of others, but back then it was almost unheard of, especially considering the number of products that he willingly promoted. He is immortalised at Derby as a result of the chant penned by Mark Tewson and Martin Miller in 1996 entitled Steve Bloomer's Watching and a bronze statue of him inside of Pride Park. It is placed in a rather unusual position, as it is right by the home dugout, to make sure that Steve Bloomer really is watching over what the team does on the pitch. It was thanks to the work of Kalwinder Singh Dinsa and Andrew Edwards, the latter of whom sculpted the statue, that there is a bust of him put up in the first place. Statue or not, Bloomer should be remembered as a pioneer, a marksman, and, most importantly of all, a legend in the English game, although it is only recently, as a result of a lack of scholarly works on footballers up until the last few decades, that he is finally getting the full recognition that he deserves.
But that just about wraps up today's football on Derby County's finest ever footballer and one of the greatest footballers England has ever produced. And I really do hope that you enjoyed it. And of course, if you did, hit that like button to show your support for the channel and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I really do hope that I did your video suggestion justice, Paul. But uh, if I didn't, then, well, I can only apologize. But as I say, if you have any other suggestions for footballers or events or whatever that you would like me to cover, stick them down in the comments below and I'll try my best to make them happen and materialize them into a video. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, I'll see you then.